We're good. So mote it be? So mote it be. All right. It is good to be back at Shofar. Man, with all the Shofar is. We're going to be in John 6 today, starting a new chapter. Well, we started a new year. Were you all following along while we were gone? Were you? Good. Good. Today we're going to cover John chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. And I think what I'd like to do is just read that first. And then we'll come back and look at it, just to kind of keep it all in context. So John, chapter 6, verse 1. After these things, Yeshua went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great multitude followed him, because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. And Yeshua went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was nigh. When Yeshua lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he said unto Philip, When shall we buy bread that these may eat? And he said this to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said unto him, there is a lad here which has five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? And Yeshua said, Make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in a number about 5,000. And Yeshua took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. When they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together, and they filled twelve baskets with the fragments of five barley loaves, which remained over, and above unto them that had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Yeshua did, said, This is of a truth that prophet that should come into the world. So that's what we're going to look at today. The feeding of the five thousand. You know... Our church at Round Prairie, I, I still don't know what it's for, but on two pews, when you walk down the aisle on each side, so on the end of this pew and the end of this pew, one had like, I think it was a bottle of wine and a wine glass, and the other one had like two loaves of bread, like carved in the wood right there, about three or four pews back. And it had, I don't know why it was just those two with those carvings, but does anybody know? It's like a church thing. I, I don't know. I don't it's a tradition. We must do this. Okay, so the Sea of Galilee, um, which is where he is, it's also known in modern Hebrew as Kinneret. It's also called Lake Gen Esaret, or Lake Tiberias, as we read here. It's a large freshwater lake in Israel. Everybody know where it is? I didn't know where it was until I started studying for this. It's a big lake in Israel, and it's, um, this is how big it is, 13 miles long, 8 miles wide, so that's pretty big. It's 33 miles all the way around, and when I read that, I thought they should have a race around the lake, right? You know, just like a running race or something. That'd be almost a marathon plus. It is 700 feet below sea level, which makes it the largest, the lowest freshwater lake in the world, and it's the second lowest lake in the world. So it's the lowest freshwater lake, and it's the second lowest lake in the world. The lowest lake is what? It's not freshwater. Not Baikal? Nope. No. The Dead Sea. Dead Sea's the, Dead sea is the lowest. It's lower than 700 feet. So that's this body of water that we're talking about. Josephus, you all know who he was, right? Wrote history. We can kind of learn a lot about the time. He wrote about this lake. He said it was full of fish. There were, at the time, he wrote about it, 200 people, 200 boats on the lake plying their trade with fishing. Um, there's settlements all around this lake, little villages, of course, because it's water. Lots of boats and boat traffic and ferries were on the lake because, you know, if it's only eight miles wide, yes, you could walk 16 miles to get around to the other side, or you could get in a boat and go across. So there are people making their money doing that. Um, 
Let's see what else. We can read in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, this is where Yeshua recruited Simon, Andrew, John, and James on the shores. Remember when he says, come with me and I'll make you fishers of men? That, that part, that was on this lake that that happened. And a lot of other things happen on this lake. The Sermon on the Mount that Yeshua gives is on a, on a mountain overlooking the lake. Um, when Yeshua walks on water, when Peter walks on water, that's in this lake. Uh, when Yeshua calms the storm, that's in this lake. And as we just read now, the feeding of the 5,000 takes place on a, on a slope overlooking this lake. So it's, it's a pretty, I mean, if I went to Israel, I would want to go see this place, right, and, and check it out. So that's where we are. Another interesting thing, in 1909, Kvutsat Kinneret, remember Kinneret's another name for the, for the lake, um, was the first kibbutz established in Israel. And it's a cooperative farming and fishing community. They set it up on the lake, uh, on the side there. And it's what, you know, if you think about it, what Straightway's doing, what we're kind of trying to do with Shofar Mountain, kind of the concept behind it originally, was, you know, a farming, agricultural kind of community all living together. So that was on this lake also. All right, so that's all of that. So, verse 2. A great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them which were diseased. And so how did this great multitude follow Yeshua? Was there a flotilla of boats going across the lake? There was not. He got on a boat and scooted up ahead because it was easier to do that than, than walk. They followed along on the shore, right, and went up after him. Why did they follow him? That's right. They knew that he was the guy that performed miracles, and they wanted to see more. And it's like, hey, this is a big, this is big doings going on. Let's go check this out. That's the guy that does miracles. Hey, there he is in that boat. Come on. Let's go. Where's he going? You know, and since he didn't take off straight across the lake, it's like, okay, then he's probably going up here, and we can walk. If his boat had gone at a right angle, they might kind of follow him. But they did. Verse 3, And Yeshua went up into a mountain where he sat with his disciples. So why did he go up into the mountain? I think the reason he went up there, it was nicer. It's cooler. There's breezes, right? It's like, let's go up here. It's really nice. Let's get up above, you know, the, we get off the boat. Let's go up here. There's breezes. It's a cool view. Let's see, you know, what's going on. I mean, why there versus anywhere else? Um, I forgot one other thing. Do you remember the one where it's like, hey, put your, put your net on that side of the boat? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it almost sinks the boat. That was here, too. It's all there. It, it's, it's all right there. Um, and so, they went, it's nice to you, but they had to go up, right? It says he went up the mountain. So, it's a hike. Sister Kate and I spent two months on Flatland, Kansas, and we took, like, maybe three hikes the whole time, and those hikes were the longest ones, about a mile and a half. <laughs> maybe? What? You think? Okay, so two miles, whatever, on flat land. And then we get out here and we just come walking up that hill that we can't drive up right now. And it's like, whew, <laughs> we need to get back here. And so they're hiking up a hill. It was effort. It, you know, it would have been easier just to walk along the shore and say, hey, let's sit over here. But they went up the hill. It was worth the view. Um, and that's that. So these people are following Yeshua and then they walk up the mountain right where he goes because he ends up with this crowd of people because they want to see him they want to learn more about him they want to figure him out more and so that brings a question to mind to us what are you doing how willing are you what effort are you willing to put out to get closer to Yeshua to figure out Yeshua right because a lot of times I think and you know I preach with three fingers pointing at me and one finger pointing at you but I think we get a little bit lazy and it's like oh yeah it's all right here and I can read that later um, or I can learn about that later. Life is good. And believe me, for the last two months, life has been really good for Sister Kate and I. It's like, oh, look, lights come on, lights go off. That's really cool. Um, but these people were willing to, to put some effort in to figure out Yeshua better. And so what's the effort that we're putting in to figure him out better? That's kind of what I thought about. All right, so they climb up the mountain. Verse 4, the Passover, the feast of the Jews was nigh. That's what it says, right? Does it say that? Uh, I don't have my duct tape Bible. I left it in Kansas. But... Yeah, of the Yehudim. So the, the Feast of the Jews. So 
Keep a, keep a finger here. What's our go-to verse for all festivals and feasts? Leviticus 23. Leviticus 23. That's right. So go there. Leviticus 23, verse 1. <clears throat> and Yahweh spoke unto Moshe, saying... That's how you should read the Bible, right? <laughs> Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them concerning the feast of the Jews, which ye shall proclaim. Is that what it says? In no. Are you guys reading along? Yeah. No one jumped up and said, no. <laughs> Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them concerning the feast of the Jews, which ye shall proclaim. No, it's the feast of Yahweh. Right? And this is one of the things that I came to understand early in my coming to the way, it's because people say, oh, you, that cult up there on, on the road, they, they're keeping, you know, they, they keep those Jewish holidays. They're like weird Jews or something. They're not Jewish festivals. They're not Jewish feasts. The fact, Jews keep them, so people say those are Jewish feasts, but they're the feasts of Yah, right? They're the appointed times of Yah, not the Jews. So why does it say when we're reading here? Well, let me just finish this. Uh, verse 2. Speak unto the children of Israel, say unto them concerning the feast of Yahweh, the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations. Even these are my feasts. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Shabbat, the Sabbath of rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of Yahweh in all your dwellings. These are the feasts of Yahweh, even holy convocations, which ye shall proclaim in their seasons. In the fourteenth day of the first month, at the evening, is Yahweh's Passover. Not the Jews' Passover, not the Feast of the Jews, it's the Feast of the Lord. And the Passover, a Feast of the Jews, was nigh, is what we just read about. Now, I should know this, like, off the top of my fingers, for each one of you, how you came to go from Christianity keeping Torah. Did anybody here, other than the young people, go raised in Torah? Nobody was, right? For me, it was, in a big part, this right here, in Leviticus, because somebody wrote me an email, and they said, Pastor Joe, a lot of the homeschoolers are, start are starting to celebrate the Jewish feasts. What do you know about them? And I didn't know anything about them. And I said, Shelly, I don't know anything about it. I'll get back to you. And so I went, learning about the Jewish feast, just like we just read, the Feast of the Jews was, was nigh, and um, Leviticus 23, and at the same time in my life, um, the Holy Spirit was bugging me about keeping Sabbath. And so when you go to read about the feast, the first thing you read about is what we're doing right now, this weekly appointed time, because that's really what feast is, right, Moedim, um, set apart, holy, um, for us, and it's like, whoa, we're supposed to do this. We're supposed to do what we're doing right now. I was talking to Sister Susie earlier, and it's like, if you're here in this area, and you're an Israelite, you need to be with other Israelites, at least on Shabbat. If, if no other time, you know, we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, all the more so as we see the day approaching. Um, so that just came out of a conversation we had earlier, but... We need, to, we need to stay together on Shabbat. It's a holy convocation. A convocation means coming together. Holy means set apart. And so we have set apart this time, and this is what we do. Preaching to the choir. I'm here, Pastor Joe. Why are you telling me that? Be here next week. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let's go back to uh, John, chapter 6. I'm not used to this table. All right. So, it's the Passover, the Feast of Yahweh. Why does it say it was the Feast of the Jews? What do you think? Why does it say that in our Bible, it's the Feast of the Jews? Because the Jews are celebrating it. it. It's during Roman times, right? So there's Romans in the area, there's Jews in the area, and all these Jews, where do you think these, I'm getting kind of ahead of myself in the sermon, but why do you think these 5,000 guys are all on the move? Because three times a year, all the men were supposed to go to Israel to the temple, right? The Feast of Passover, the Feast of the Jews, all these Jews come in from all over the place, right? All these Israelites are coming from out of the land, 
and Passover's fixing to happen, it's not like they all show up right at sunset, uh, you know, on Passover. They're coming into town early. They're getting ready. And so this is what's going on. And that's why it says the Feast of the Jews was nigh. That's explaining why all these people are on the move. All right. So, verse 5. When Yeshua lifted up his eyes, he saw a great company come unto him. And he said unto Philip, where are we going to buy bread that these guys can eat? And he said this to prove them, for he himself knew what he would do. Prove is another word for what? I heard somebody say it. Test. He said that to test them. He's testing his guys. He asked a question. You know, they say you should never... Don't they say this? Is this a law school thing? You should never ask a question you don't know the answer to when you're cross-examining somebody? Where were you on the night of June 3rd, 1973? And then in the movies, they're always like, I was at my mother's house. Let's, I'd be like, I don't know. <laughs> Give me a calendar. But you should never ask a question you don't know the answer to. And of course, Yeshua knows the answer to his question. He says, hey, how are we going to feed all the? Where are we going to buy bread that these people can eat? I submit to you, he's a leader, right? He's a leader of the 12, right here, that his disciples. And he's like, good leaders always test their people. They're constantly testing their people. They're, they're getting a pulse of the people. They're seeing where the people are at. They're seeing that the lessons they've taught have stuck with them. And so he's asking them, hey, where do you think we're going to get the bread to feed 5,000 people out here? He wants to see what they'll say. I don't really think they passed this test, right? He knows where he's going with this. They don't. Verse 7, Philip answers him, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them that everyone may take a little. So he gives them an amount of money, which is, that's two weeks worth of pay, basically, um, for everybody there, all the disciples that are there. It's like six months of pay, right, is, is what 200 penny weight is. So one person, six months pay, or 12 disciples, eh, two weeks pay each. What he, Philip doesn't say is, which I think is cool, I think he kind of passes the test in one way, why are we feeding these people? You want to feed 5,000 people? Why are we going to do that? Instead, he goes to, well, all right, I know how much money we have. We have this month, you know, 200 penny weight, and that's not going to make a dent in this. Right? I mean, he's basically saying, Yeshua, I don't know. All the money we have is 200 penny weights, and that's not going to feed. Sorry, I keep forgetting you there. I'm not, I'm not like looking at you. <laughs> that's not going to feed these people. That's not even going to put a debt in feeding these people. So I don't know what we're going to do. But he does not say, Let, why are we feeding them? Which I, I, I found that interesting. I mean, think about it. They get on their boat. They go up the coast. They get off. They're going to have a little chit-chat with Yeshua. All these people show up because they're curious. Can you not see yourself saying, why is it incumbent on us to feed these people? It, didn't they know it was lunchtime? And what, they're not carrying food? I mean, what is it? Why are you looking at me? It's not, is it our responsibility to feed these people? I mean, you can see people saying that today, right? I, I could almost, almost feel myself saying that. So, where are they going to get the bread, right? They don't even know. They're on the side of a hill. One of the disciples... Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said unto him, Hey, there's a lad here which has five barley loaves and two small fishes. Hmm, but what are they to all these people? So he's trying to solve the problem. It's like, all right, we're looking for food. The master said, you know, how are we going to, let's feed these people. He says we only have this much money in any way. That wouldn't make a dent in it. Hey, at least there's a little kid selling food. And I guess I'm in a Korea part of my brain today. Um, because when I was in the Army as a lieutenant, we'd go to Korea once a year for this huge exercise. Um, and there's a bazillion people out there. And we never knew where we were going to be. For, and we're infantry, right? So we're walking all day, digging holes, getting the hole, pointing your guns out. And then your boss comes and says, all right, we're moving that way. And you walk all night. And you go somewhere else and you dig a hole in another side of a mountain. And there's two sides to the battle. There's Koreans and Americans on one side, Koreans and Americans on the other side. Blue forces, yellow forces, and, and you kind of, it's a game. And so we never knew we were going to go next. And my guys would say, hey, sir, are we moving out tonight? And I'd be like, guys, I don't know. You know, as soon as the captain tells me, I'll tell you. Um, but we could be here for six hours, two hours, all night. I don't know. So we never knew we were going. Well, we'd get up, you know, you'd, we'd walk kind of through the valleys, and then we'd climb a mountain to put our defensive position in. And here would come this old, older than everybody here, Korean lady, woman, Ajima. 
like bent over old woman with this bamboo pole thing on her. And she'd have like these silver pots all nested together on this side and, and like these thermos things on the other side. And she would come, we call it humping a rucksack. She'd come carrying this thing up this, and there's steep mountains there. And she's like, come on, come on. And honestly, I bet you she's 70. I mean, she looked like she was 70. And she'd come out and she'd set that thing down and no one would mess with her. It's like we're playing army, but obviously she's not a spy, right? She'd set it down and then you would either buy a bowl of ramen. She had these little bowls that she carried up there somewhere. You could buy a bowl of ramen for some money or you could trade your MREs for like ramen, a moon pie, and a Coke. And so this lady would make all this money. She'd be real happy. The ramen was really good. We'd eat it. We didn't know where we were going the next day, but the next day, 20 miles later, down the road, we're on the side of a hill, and this same old lady comes hiking up every day for 10 days. Same old woman. She knew where we were going to be, and she would come up there, and I think for her, she was making a lot of money. It had to be worth her while to hike up that hill with that stuff, because there's no road up there. Um, and so I got to thinking about that when I was reading this, and here's this little boy... And it's the feast time. Travelers are coming through. It's like the tourist industry in towns, right? You know, a lot of towns, we were just in, where were we? Mountain View, Mountain Home? Yeah, that one. Yeah, that one. Um, it was a tourist town, music and stuff. And they make all their money off people passing through, um, you know, selling food, giving them hotels, stuff. Well, I think this is this little kid who's like, hey, mom, bake me some bread. I'll go sell it to the pilgrims, you know, to the travelers that are coming through. And so this little kid's on the side of the mountain, and he's trying to make some money, but it's not enough, right? It's only five loaves of bread, two little fishes. And so um, that's that. Verse 10. And Yeshua said, all right, make the men sit down. Now there was, this is cool, now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down in a number about 5,000. Does that look weird to y'all? I mean, just, we're reading the story. And then it says, And Yeshua said, Make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, and the number was 5,000. What part of that verse looks out of place to you? Grass. 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 I mean, that's like, how does this inform the story? I get it. We're, we're Sea of Galilee, hillside, people. Oh, now we find out there's 5,000. Everyone sit down. We're about to eat. Why is the grass in this? It's softer. It's softer than sitting on a rock. Why talk about it? I think I know why. Because you never ask a question that you don't know the answer to. <laughs> Keep your finger here. Go to Psalm 23. Psalm 23, verse 1. Oh, this is the scriptures. They're different than my King James. Where's the Psalms in here? There it is. I found it. <laughs> it's different. In my Bible, you know, it's old. I can just go and get there. But this one's kind of... All right. <clears throat> Psalms 23 The Lord is my shepherd Yahweh is my shepherd I shall not want He maketh me to lie down In green pastures He leads me beside still waters He restores my soul He leads me in Paths of righteousness For his name's sake I think that's why we read about Grass being there He's leading me to the green, soft grass. And what's he about to do? He's about to feed these people, right? Um, I think that's why it's there. Because it, it, if you look at that again, it just doesn't make sense to put that in there. All right, everybody sit down. There was a lot of grass there. It's like, you could tell them to sit down in the sand and the rocks. They would sit down. I mean, they're tired. They want to hear what he has to say. So I think that's why that's there. Now... One thing to consider is that there's 5,000 men... And so, you know, they've got something to do, right? They're on the move. They're going to the temple. And that's kind of like the goal. Like, I'm a mission-oriented guy. It's like, all right, bye, sweetie. I'm going to the temple. I keep forgetting you're there. <laughs> There's only children here. I'm, I'm going to the temple. I'll be back in a couple weeks after, you know, unleavened bread. I'll see you. So in my mind, and again, this is probably saying more about me than these guys, but I want to get to Jerusalem, to the temple, figure out where I'm going to stay for the next week, get that all sorted. I don't necessarily want to stop halfway there and just have a big confab uh, on the side of the lake listening to this guy. But they do. They're like, oh no, this is important. I want to take my time out. Because see, you got to understand, these people, by and large, don't know that he's the Messiah. 
He's just a dude. I mean, I, I'm not trying to be blasphemous or anything at all, but it's like, hey, there's a really cool juggler over there. You want to see him? I'd be like, no, man, i got to go to the temple. i got this it's Passover. I want to get there. There's a really smart guy over there saying stuff. You want to go see him? No, I want to get to the temple. But these people know in their heart, and they want to see. They've heard, hey, he's doing miracles. So in their mind, they're thinking there is something special about Yeshua, and they're taking time out of their busy day to do that. <coughs> Deuteronomy 16, 16. You don't have to turn there. I'll just read it to you. Three times in a year shall all your males appear before Yahweh thy Elohim in the place which he shall choose. In the Feast of Unleavened Bread, in the, which starts when? When is it? Passover, right? Unleavened Bread starts at Passover. That's why they're all coming. In the Feast of Unleavened Bread, in the Feast of Weeks, in the Feast of Tabernacles. And they shall not appear before Yahweh empty. Now here's something else that's kind of interesting. The first Passover kicked off Exodus, right? And everyone flees, and we, we all know that story, and they, and they go wandering around the desert. Um, they are sustained in the desert by God, by Yahweh, primarily with what? Manna. manna. And manna is, what is it, right? We know that. But it's basically, if you will, a form of bread, right? They are given bread, and that sustains them on their journey to the promised land. The promised land has been found. It's been discovered. The Israelites have occupied it, and now the temple is where it's supposed to be. So here's all these people making their journey to the very center of the promised land, and they're being sustained for lunch by miraculous bread from Yeshua. I think that's cool. I, I, I was reading that, just looking at that, and going, man, this is neat how he's doing that. They don't even realize it yet, because they don't know they're going to get fed. They just want to sit down and listen to what he's going to say. Which also gets me thinking, 5,000 people. How many people fit in the stadium? 60. 60? So a section of the stadium, right? I mean, I've seen military formations of 1,000 people, and it's really hard to hear what the boss is saying. And nowadays, they use loudspeakers. <laughs> what are 5,000 people thinking they climb up the side of this mountain and they want to hear this guy, I wonder, I, I do really wonder how that happened. I don't have an answer to this. I'm not asking a question. I mean, do you think, like, somebody would talk and then other people would pass it back? Because you know the guys up there can't hear what's going on. I mean, I don't think so. I don't think Yeshua got up there and spoke like that. Like, you know, Mel Gibson riding his horse back and forth in front of everybody. <clears throat> All right. So they're given this miraculous bread. Verse 11, And Yeshua took loaves, and when he had given thanks... He distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them which were set down, and likewise of the fishes, as much as they would. <coughs> Can you see the orderliness of this? Yeshua gives it to the twelve disciples, then they go give it to the five thousand. I'm willing to bet. It's like, all right, Brother Fletch, because now we're the disciples. You take that section, I'll take this section. And it's like captains of thousands, captains of hundreds, captains of 50, right? And I think they probably went out there. Does anybody here think that the 12 guys spread out bread one at a time, everybody? I'm thinking they went and said, here, you go pass that out to those guys. You pass that out to those guys. You pass. I mean, it, it was a hierarchical kind of pass down, but there's an order to it. It wasn't chaos. It wasn't everyone bum rushing the, the, the guys holding baskets of bread. And there's only five loaves, so they're split up and put in those baskets. What are the disciples, the students of the Master Yeshua, what are they doing? They're passing out bread, right? He says, pass out the bread. I thought it was kind of interesting. I mean, it's like, because I try to put things in. I always am thinking, what would this look like today? Nobody says, well, how come we're passing out the bread? What are you doing? <laughs> right? I mean, can you not see people seeing that today? Or if not, having the, the guts to say that to him? So it's now me and Justin, and, and like we've just been giving bread to hand out. It's like, Shh, how come we're handing out the bread, man? He's never out there handing out bread. Here, you want some bread? Okay. No, they're serving the master, right? They're doing what he says to do. They're serving Yah. They're serving Yeshua. And they're out there doing it without complaining. They're just going out and doing their business because he told them to. He's told us to do a lot of things. We get to read about it. 
They didn't have a neat little book to look at to say, Here, here's how we're supposed to conduct ourselves and all these things. He's told us what to do. How many of us then just go, okay, let's go do that. Most of us, to a degree, to a degree. And do we grumble sometimes? Yeah, maybe. Well, I think we do. So they're serving. Um, they're, they're listening to him. Oh, yeah, this is the other thing. These 5,000 people that are sitting there, we can assume it's probably lunchtime, right? Since somebody brought up, hey, let's feed these people. Are they starving? No. I would submit you not even close. Are they poor? I think they're just people. I think it's like us. Brothers, we're going to straightway for, you know, whatever. Let's all go. And halfway there, we stop somewhere. We're, we're going to do something. And somebody says, hey, y'all want to eat? They're not starving. They're not poor. It's not like they're the huddled masses that, that need charity. They're just peeps. They're just people. And yet here's these disciples going out and feeding these people. A lot of churches, my church around Perry was one of them, today, go through these spurts where it's like, hey, we're going to do angel food. If you don't know what that is, it doesn't matter. It's just a, a food distribution kind of thing. Or we're all going to do a can drive, or we're going to go give it to the poor. Or Thanksgiving, Christmas, we're going to get together these turkey dinners, and we're going to give them to the widows and the poor people in this family that need some help in, in our church or in our community, um, because these are good works that Christians are supposed to do, right? I'm not saying anything's wrong with that on the face. Go give food to poor people. Awesome. Go, get, go give, help a brother out. But this is the equivalent of us, a congregation, saying, hey, there's a, a bunch of guys, not firemen because firemen are popular, uh, not cops because in a lot of places, you know, we show our support of law enforcement, not soldiers, you know, because we support the soldiers. Thank you for serving. But there's just like a bunch of people down in the park in this little town down here. And we're like, hey, let's go, let's go make them lunch and just give them lunch. Just regular people. Hey, y'all want something to eat? How many times do we ever see that? Has anybody ever seen that? Where you just go give food to people just for the heck of it? Just to serve? Like, hey, you want some food? Not like, oh, you're all dirty and have no good clothes and you're obviously poor. Here, brother, here's some food. Oh, thanks, man. <laughs> Those people living on Shofar, they need our help. We should go help them. <laughs> Here you are, brother. Thank you. <laughs> Haven't eaten in a week. Um, when I was thinking about this, I was thinking if a, if a church said, what was the example I used? The stadium. It's the football game. Let's all go to the football game and just hand out food to the people in the parking lot. Can you imagine if a church said that? I move that we spend $500 of the church funds to buy a bunch of Chick-fil-A meals and let's just go hand them out at the football stadium. People would argue about that. We shouldn't do that. We should do this. We should da 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 These are regular people that are getting fed. I think it's neat that it's happening. It's just love of fellow man. That's what it is. That's a true heart of charity. Because you see, I think, and again, I don't want to diminish helping out poor people and the less fortunate. I, I'm not trying to do that, but I think there's a little psychic payback when we do that. All right, we're all gonna gather together, we're gonna do this cool thing for the poor people. All right, high five, look at us, squared away the poor people. As opposed to just these regular people out here. Hey, let's all go make Rick and Jeannie dinner. Wow, they're perfectly capable of making dinner themselves. So I think this is getting to a true heart of service, a true heart of loving your fellow man. You show us like, hey, all these people are here, let's feed them. So it's something to think about. When they were filled, filled, that's kind of a key word, he said to his disciples, okay, gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. I don't know. See, I've been gone from you all for two months, and I missed you all, and then I realized the holes in the things that I don't know about you while I was gone. So if this sounds like I'm poking at you, I don't know this about any of you, but if I am, I am. Kate and I have known people who like, eh, we don't eat leftovers. We eat leftovers. I think things like chili and spaghetti and stuff like that are actually better leftover. I told Kate she made something while we were gone. I said, Curry, you ought to just make it and put it in the fridge, and we'll eat it tomorrow. It'll be better, right? Um, but there are people out there who don't eat leftovers. It's like, my mother, 
Leftovers? Yeah, that's what poor people do. I don't know. That's how they look at it. She wouldn't look at it that way. He's like, hey, let's go gather this stuff up. We don't want to waste any of it, right? So they go gather it up. Um, that's stewardship at a, at a different level. Um, taking care of what you have. And what's the phrase? Waste not, want not, right? A penny saved is a penny earned. I think that was Ben Franklin said that. Verse 13, therefore they gathered them together and they filled 12 baskets with the fragments of of the five barley loaves which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. This is exploring with you. I don't have an answer to this one, but 12 is the number of governmental perfection, right? Biblical mathematics. You guys, are you guys familiar with biblical mathematics? There's like numbers that are used in the Bible and they mean things when they use them. Like four typically represents the earth, right? And that's where we get the four corners of the earth. Because, you know, it's flat. It's like a square. <laughs> but, you know, you do get the four corners of the earth. People say, why did I say four? Why don't I say five? Um, because it represents the earth. Twelve, twelve people on a jury. Why are there twelve people on a jury? I mean, why? Why not thirteen? Why not? What, you know, you'd think thirteen would be better. You could go with a majority. Right? Um, but twelve, because it represents governmental protection, perfection. I don't know what five represents. Does anybody? Somebody will leave a comment on YouTube. Chuck this. Chuck. Huh? Chuck this or we'll leave a comment. <laughs> Chuck, leave us a comment, brother. All right. You think he's watching? All right. Here's the deal. I, I think one of the points out of this is that there can be abundance with Yeshua. If we seek him, we receive abundantly. I get the comment on my YouTube channel, you're a pastor, don't you trust God to provide for you? <laughs> and I said, I, I just responded this week, I said, yeah, I do trust God to provide for me, absolutely. And I also think he expects me to do my part. You know, by the sweat of your brow shall you eat your bread. We're supposed to go do something for it. That doesn't mean I don't trust Yah. It's not like, all right, if, if this doesn't happen, we're not going to eat tomorrow, sweetie. Yah's going to provide. I get that. Um, I have found that he provides in abundance when we truly turn ourselves over to him, when we truly seek his face and put our hands into him. Everybody here, now this I do know about us, everybody here at one time has been confronted with some big problem and then said, ah, oh, and it's like, oh, you know what, I'm going to turn this over to the Father. Has anybody turned it over to the Father and been disappointed? I remember when you were looking for your first house here or whatever, that one house that we were all like, that's the perfect house for them, man. It's perfect. And it, it didn't come through. And everyone was disappointed. We were disappointed. And then we were all like, you know what? Yeah, it's got a plan. Now you live right there. And that's a much better house. Um, and so when we turn it over to him, I think he rewards us with abundance. And that's what we're doing here. All these leftovers are coming back. That just shows that it wasn't just five loaves. It just was so much that... People are like, I'm done, man, thanks. Um, there's leftovers. Seek, and ye shall find. Ask, and it shall be given unto you. Verse 14. Then those men, when they had seen... This is important, too. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet, which should come into the world. So there's two things there. One, um, what are they talking about? They said, this is of a truth, that prophet, that should come into the world. Do you guys know? Messiah, but they're talking about, I think they're talking about a specific thing. Turn with me to Deuteronomy 18.15. Just so you can see it with your own eyes. Deuteronomy 18.15. As soon as you see it, you're going to remember it. Unless your brother Justin here, he knows what it is. He has that mind. Deuteronomy 18.15. <clears throat> Yahweh, thy Elohim, will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, and to him ye shall hearken. Everybody's always wondered who that prophet was. Who's, that? Who's Moshe talking about? These guys are like, oh, this is surely the guy that Moshe was talking about. So it says... I said this is important. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle, Yeshua did. So who saw the miracle? Who knew what Yeshua had done? Those men. Was that the 5,000? The apostles. It was the apostles. Those 5,000 people had no clue. 
all of a sudden bread starts showing up in baskets and fish start showing up in baskets. I didn't know what was going on down there with that guy and his little helpers. And he's like, hey, what are we going to do, man? They just pass this up. It'll be okay. The apostles knew what was going on. The, you know, the disciples that are around Yeshua, and they realize, oh, this is surely that prophet. They're starting to catch a clue. And I submit to you that this is what we call in the army an esprit de corps exercise. They do it in industry, too. They have these things. I actually thought about being one of the guys that ran this business where you set up the obstacle course and you bring the, all the business executives and you're like, all right, your task is to get your crew and this 55-gallon barrel over that wall. Go. And then they all fight and work together. And at the end of it, you counsel them and you say, all right, this is what you did. And they do several of these exercises. And at the end, you tell them how good they are and how they learn to work together. And you guys are a great team, team building exercise. And they're like, yeah, high five. We got it. That's what's going on here. Yeshua's like, hey, check this out. And they're like, whoa, this is the master. And that fires them up. That gives them a spree to continue on because life's about to get hard in, in a relatively short period of time here for all of these people. And so it's like, we got to build up the core to show them going forward so you are energized to go out and spread the good word of Yeshua to all the people. And I submit that's what this was in a spree um, building exercise. And he is showing them something amazing. They see it with their own eyes, and they see the bread that comes back when they're gathering all together. And when they see that, when they start to realize they are stronger because of it. They're stronger as individuals, and they're stronger as the little cohort that's following Yeshua around everywhere he goes. When they see that happen, they say, this is of a truth, the prophet that should come into the world. Final thing about this little bit of scripture. This is the only incident anywhere like this that is in all four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All the other ones, a lot of them are in three. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, right? The synoptic Gospels. Um, this is the only one that's in all four of them. And so that means it's important. And that means it bears, I think, for us, looking into it on our own. Too. Like, go back, you know, this week, read it, and see what you come up with. And it's like, oh, well, I see this. Because there has to be a reason we're told four times. And it's not just a coincidence. Let's pray. I'm going to turn this off.